Bonjour. Welcome to the So French podcast, the show about the twists and turns, intrigues and insights to all things French. Every two weeks, we select the best, most interesting and fascinating of French news stories, all brought to you from, well, this week we're at the, actually outside of our, our offices, we're at the Champs-Élysées, almost. We are heading to the offices of Sophie Peder, the Economist magazine's bureau chief here in Paris. My name is Stefan Vries. And my name is Sara Bertelsson. Now, this week, we bring you a So French special summer edition. Um, it has been more than a year now, and he has been a regular feature in this very podcast. In this episode, we're concentrating on the French president Emmanuel Macron, a new hope for France or a president for the rich. Uh, who better to talk with, uh, to talk to about this than the journalist whose book about the president just has been released, Sophie Peder. Thank you very much for being our guest today. It's a pleasure to join you. Révolution Française, Emmanuel Macron and the quest to reinvent a nation. Uh, first of all, you have met the president himself several times, regularly, maybe even, and you've interviewed him. What is he like? I think uh, the first thing that strikes you when you have a conversation or an interview is that, uh, you know, as a journalist, I'm very used to talking to politicians who try and av avoid the question. I mean, the whole point for them is to say what they want to say and not think about the question. And what, what's quite striking, I think, with the French president is that he really engages with that with those questions. And that was my experience. You can see it sometimes in interviews he's given publicly, um, that he, he, he enjoys a discussion, you know, and the more challenging the question, the more he wants to engage. You know, he's somebody who likes debate. So the first thing that strikes you is that, um, you know, I think genuinely enjoying that kind of conversational setup. Uh, he's also somebody with, uh, you know, very good sort of em empathetic um, skill when he is in a one-to-one -one situation. You know, he gives the person who's interviewing him the impression that they, they that they are interesting, that they're actually that they matter. And, and people who I res who I spoke to when I was researching the book, they said this about you know all sorts of people say this. You know, whether it's a business people or people he worked with on the campaign, you know, when they talk to him, they come away you know almost I would say under under a sort of spell. It's extraordinary. I mean, people said that about uh, Bill Clinton or, um, you know, Tony Blair, even. There are certain politicians who have that sort of charisma and that ability to make you think that, that, this, that this meeting matters. And that is something that comes across. And I suppose the last thing I would say is... Um, You know, he's very clever. He knows it. So, you know, there is a kind of public problem with that, which is that, you know, he comes across as, 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 as a, as a bit of a know-it-all. But he is also therefore very interesting to talk to because he can go off and talk for one minute. It'll be about German philosophy. The next minute it'll be about detail of labor market reform. The, then, then it'll be about, you know, the problems of geostrategy, uh, in, in, or in, in the Middle East. And it's, it's a, it's a kind of ability to, I think, retain the big picture, but also the small detail that makes a conversation quite 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 uh, unusual. The book is called French Revolution. Is Emmanuel Macron a revolution, a big a change for France? Well, the, the reason I, I used the title was that extraordinary sense that one had last year um, of a complete renewal. You know, this was not only a president who sort of came from nowhere, you know, had never stood for election in any office. He was the youngest candidate, uh, certainly the youngest president uh, since Napoleon. Um, he had uh, no background in political campaigning and everyone said it was impossible. And then it was followed by a legislative election where the parliament, uh, the cast, the sort of cast face of the parliament completely transformed. You know, you used to sit there in the National Assembly, you see all these sort of uh, elderly men in suits. And today, 45% is women. Um, it's uh, much younger, much more diverse. So it's that, it's the sense of sort of complete renewal, renewal of generations, renewal of the, the, the party itself, the party system. That's the sense in which I meant, uh, which I, I use the title. Obviously, the question now becomes, you know, what can one actually do in office? What can he do in office? And how far is he able to really sort of change French 
you know French mentalities and 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 sort of shift the country forward. But um, that's obviously a much much more open question. And the the sort of uh, you know at the moment that's work in progress. And I think after a year, it's very difficult to say. You know, this is you would be absurd to say there's been a revolution in in France in the in sort of uh, you know in its in economic performance or. Um, but I think it's the it, the way I I meant to use the title was very much that that moment of sort of you know complete renewal that took place last year. Yeah, now we're about um, over a year later after his election. Um, it looks like that his promises, well, you're, you're right to mention that it's maybe too early to judge. But if you look at the numbers, um, France is the only country in Europe where the unemployment is not uh, decreasing. The economic growth is the lowest, almost the lowest of the European Union. It doesn't look really well, even though you can't blame him, of course, but it's there's no signs that the economy is really picking up again. I think it's, uh, the, the, you know, it, you, you, it depends what you're comparing it with. If you look at the sort of stagnation that you've had in the French economy in recent years and the fact that unemployment has until very recently been actually rising, you know, the fact that it's going down at all is is a certain form of progress. Um, there are things that are looking better, in better shape than they were before. The public finances is one example. The French uh, budget deficit has not been under 3%, which is what it has to be under European Union rules. Uh, for 11 years and this year it is um, it's, it's now it is it, it, it is below three percent. You know, uh, there are things that are imp- have improved in France. I think some other measures are interesting to look at, like um, the amount of investment in the tech sector in France. I mean, in Paris, uh, there's been Paris has become you know an extraordinarily uh, attractive destination for in tech investment, which wasn't in the case. You know, money was going to London or it was going to Berlin, um, and there's a sort of new interest in in Paris. So I think you can look at different measures and say that there. There are some signs that things are, are 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 improving, but you know I think uh, one has to be realistic. These things don't change in in twelve months. And um, you know, for example, the labour reform that uh, President Macron brought in last September, uh, you know, that's going to take time to feed into job creation if it does, and we're not going to see that. Um, in, in six months. So I think, you know, the real judge will have to be after he's had five years in office. And I think he probably knows that, that he will be judged on results. And if he doesn't get his results, then, you know, he, he won't be reelected. Yeah. Now, in one of the chapters of your book, you try to give a definition of ma- le macronisme, the macronism. Um, you know, in France, uh, the, the politicians are always, they, they become their own current, actually. And, and you try to give a definition. The, the party re- earlier this month announced that they will uh, start a study group to find a definition <laughs> themselves. Um, what What is, according to you, um, the most, well, common denominator or, or description of this this well, political current that Emmanuel Macron impersonates. Well, I think the sort of the conceptually the the simplest way to try and understand, I think, what he's what he's doing, what he's di- what he did by setting up on Marche was to try and uh, force a different sort of fault line through French politics. So that in the past, if you had left and right being the dividing line. His view was that actually what uh, divided parties uh, you had uh, was subjects like Europe or trade or globalization, that there was as much internal division within parties um, as uh, there was difference between left and right, and that therefore he would try and sort of force a different fault line and he would bring together those both on the centre left and the centre right who were pro-European, broadly in, fo- in favour of multilateralism, the global trading system, uh, the liberal order. Um, immigration, more or less, uh, in favour of sort of a more open approach, and that that I mean, he called that progressive, um, and and set it against conservatism, which he would put in both the far left and the far right. So I think, you know, that's in a way the simplest way to think about what he was trying to do. And certainly if you look at the party system or the representation of parties in Parliament, it, it very much looks like that. You've got this huge sort of sweeping party which holds a very big majority, which reaches from the centre-left former socialists to some of the centre-right former Republicans um, and who all share a sort of that, that kind of a progressive pro-European agenda. We both come from Northern Europe. European countries. So we have sort of a tradition of social democracy and all of that. In what sense do you see that En Marche and Emmanuel Macron has, uh, is, is, is following that kind of tradition of social democracy? Or is he creating something very different from the Northern European uh, politics? 
It's, it's a very interesting question. And, and one of the sometimes I've been asked, you know, is this is he trying to sort of impose a kind of Thatcherite agenda on France? You know, when you look at the strikes um, this uh, spring over reform of the SNCF or the fact that there seems to be a kind of full on confrontation with the unions. Some people in the UK have been asking, you know, is, is this a Thatcherite figure? And my, my answer to that is absolutely not that he is he believes very strongly in the French model. I mean, he, he he's he is trying, I think, to make it more viable, to make it more uh, flexible, more reactive, less sort of a heavy system, uh, less bureaucratic, but uh, probably more along a sort of Scandinavian Nordic style sort of model than um, anything Anglo-Saxon. Uh, he, you know, he, he would n- never contemplate for a minute having things like zero hours contract um, contracts, labour contracts like you have in the UK. You know, I think he does believe in the in the French safety net and the welfare state in France, um, but he also accepts that it costs too much and that it can't continue without a sort of uh, a sort of modernisation. So I think he's caricatured as a sort of Thatcherite figure, and I know he's been called sort of Margaret Macron um, <laughs> uh, by some members of the far left in France, and I I, I see where that's coming from, but I, I really don't think that's his. His, his inspiration. I mean, if you look at his sort of political inheritance, it's actually Michel Rocard, who was a social democratic uh, socialist party uh, prime minister um, and was very much, you know, of that sort of moderate centre left, you know, with a sort of uh, a sympathy for, for business and, and an understanding that you needed to have the private sector strong and healthy in order to support uh, the economy, but at the same time, believing in the social model. So why do you think then this 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 skepticism from the French people? Because we have seen uh, since he was elected and even before this uh, quite a lot of enthusiasm on the international uh, arena for, for Emmanuel Macron. But here in France, when you're actually in the country, you feel a lot of skepticism. Why are the French so so well skeptic about I, I think it's I think it's probably two things. One of them is the fact that right very early on, the timing of his reforms was such that he uh, put in place these tax uh, cuts on the rich and reformed the wealth tax and corporate tax very early on. And he did that in order to send a very clear signal to investors that France was no longer the sort of anti wealth creating uh, culture that it had started to get a reputation for being. So I think that that immediately set in the French mind the idea that he was, you know, president who was favoring the rich. And one can understand where that comes from. Um, the other element, I suppose, is the presidential style. You know, I think the French, I, I find them sort of constantly uh, in a state of tension about what they really want from their president. You know, when when Francois Hollande was in the presidency and he would wanted to be a normal president and then people were disappointed because he didn't seem to be sort of dignified in office and they felt that he didn't represent France well. And then you have Emmanuel Macron who comes in with this theory about Jupiter and about the need to be a sort of monarch in office. And um, and then people complain that, you know, he's far too full of himself and he's arrogant and he's pompous. Um, Is it so, just French not ever being content about anything? I don't know. I mean, the French have got this wonderful sort of esprit critique, right? I mean, it's, they're, they're taught to criti- criticise everything. I think sort of it comes from Voltaire, you know, it's that part, part of their education is to be critical. And it's, it's, it's you know, it's on one hand, it's a very healthy reflex. But it does mean that I think that there is quite a lot of discontent, instinctive discontent. Um, so, yes, you know, and uh, Macron is, uh, you know, sometimes that that he that that is a that is a problem that he's going to have to deal with both of those. I mean, both in terms of policy and in terms of style. Vous écoutez So French. You are listening to So French. During his campaign, we saw a lot of European flags. That was really remarkable because he was probably the only European politician who dared actually to to use the European flag. Um, and when he became a president, he started very uh, with a lot of energy. Uh, we, he started, of course, with the uh, ode to joy when he became a president in the Louvre. But now, a year on, uh, he made a lot of speeches. But it seems that now, in the European capitals, people start to realize that he may not be the savior or the Messiah, as you know, he was on the cover of The Economist walking on water. Um, is uh, Macron now uh, hurting the European wall of reality? Uh, is Are his dreams still realistic or does he really have to change his attitude and his plans for the European Union? 
I think it's very difficult for him. Um, you know, he came to office with, I think, a very clear bargain in mind. And the idea was he would do his homework in France. In other words, he would get the public finances in order. He would start putting in place reform. He would show the, the rest of the world that France was reformable, um, get the economy back on track. And that in return, uh, the sceptics in Berlin would say, OK, you've done, kept your side of the bargain. Now we're going to be a bit more flexible on Eurozone reform. That, I think, was the, the, the 